If it's stolen, it's a, a new card would have to be issued. But the patient and caregiver can access the registry at any time and print a new card. And reprint one. Yes. Okay, thank you. But if, the, if it's stolen or they suspect fraudulent use, we would expect that they report that so we can issue a new, a new card. Okay. Going back to the technological side, it would be very handy if that barcode could be accessed mobily so you wouldn't actually have to print out a card, but you could do it with your phone. Like your airplane ticket. Mm -hmm. Sure. Okay, wrapped up on that, all right. Uh, that takes us on to 202, caregiver eligibility. Questions or comments on that section? I just have a clarification question on E, you know, one, two, three, the, um, you know, about the um, two-person limit. Um, do all three of those have to be met, or is it just one no. of the above? No, they're, they're not any of those circumstances. Those. Okay. Questions? All right. So Moving. Just, oh, sorry. Yep. Go just ahead. one thought. You know, when we were talking about uh, whether it was extended care facilities or the like, the idea of there either being a class of individual who is capable of representing more than one patient, if if there were cir circumstances that were related to to facilities of, of a type that. Um, would lend a little bit more legitimacy than to a con than to the concept that there would be somebody who would become like a higher gun patient caregiver who would have 10 or 20 who's just a, a random person on the street whereas you could have facilities where it would make a lot of sense that somebody would be representing or having the ability to be a caregiver for a lot more than just two people so that's something that we would have to examine on a case-by-case -case basis. If it would indeed present an undue hardship to those those patients, that that could. I mean, like a. It group would have home? to be examined. Yeah, like a group home. A group home for developmentally disabled adults mm -hmm. who may or may not have mental health qualifying conditions. Sure, and and again, that's something that we would we would have to consider on a case-by-case -case basis, and, and we would examine it as a, an issue of undue hardship. Okay, move on to 203, the procedure for registration for the caregivers. No comments there, we'll move on to 204, purchasing of medical marijuana. Yes. Who determines what is a 90-day supply? We do, and uh, we stay tuned, please. We're um, doing a lot of work on that right now. Uh, I, and Kurt has referenced a couple of times that there is an, an expert panel that has done a lot of research on 90-day supply, and uh, that's going to be a separate rule set. The, the statute specifically calls out that the Board of Pharmacy shall determine what a 90-day supply is, so okay. we're on it. Questions on that further? No. 205. One quick question. What if a uh, licensed cultivator or processor becomes a patient? Sorry, sir. If a licensed uh, cultivator, processor, uh, dispensary individual who owns a uh, dispensary becomes a patient themselves? There's no prohibition against that. Is that they can, it says here the patients may not cultivate or extract. That's not what you're talking about though. It, it, so they, they cannot, the, the rule itself is more prescriptive than that. Okay. They, they can't cultivate or extract. The, the language I tried to draft would prohibit them from doing that at home. But if they're doing it in compliance with the rules drafted by the Department of Commerce uh, in accordance with Chapter 3796 of the Revised Code, uh, then they would be authorized to extract and cultivate. Okay. Okay. 2-05, general parameters around the patient and caregiver registry. Yes, Ted. Um, so item G, in light of the potential, as we'll see, for whole day doses and, and other rules that I think will be fleshed out further, it says medical marijuana shall be maintained in the original dispensing package with an unalterated dispensary label. Um, if somebody were to open up, and again, I don't know that we know what that package looks like, but if they open up that package and they don't consume that whole day's dose, whatever that's going to look like, I'm 
thinking largely of plant material at this point, you know, are they not allowed to put it in another container to ensure that it continues to be tamper resistant or that it isn't um, susceptible to exposure to something? Um, or do they have to keep it in that? Uh, is it wise to, to require them to keep it in that same open package, whatever that may look like? To, to a certain degree, this is intended to protect patients and caregivers. So if a patient or caregiver is traveling with medical marijuana in the state and they have their, their medical marijuana in container with the original dispensing label on it, if that dispensing label is going to say that their name is going to have the address of the dispensary, they're going to have their card with them because the rule also requires them to carry their card with them. So they'll be able to show an, an, a law enforcement officer if, who may have pulled them over that my name on my card is the same as the name on this dispensing label. Wow. Oh, so the dispensing label at the dispensary, I'm a little off track, will be much like a pharmacy type creating a label with that person's name on yes. it? Yes. Yes. Thank you. Yes. I just need clarification on F about the 180 day supply of medical marijuana in possession when you can get only 90 days at a time i'm confused with how we get up to 180 days so the how much you can buy at a, at one time is not the same as how much you can possess at one time so we put that in there uh to set a limit for what a person could possess and if if you've received six months worth of medical marijuana and you haven't consumed any of that medical marijuana, uh, it, it, you, you should not go out and purchase more medical marijuana. At that point, uh, we, we feel comfortable saying that that becomes a diversion risk. I think it was also because a caregiver can provide, can have two patients, right? Yes. And two patients would equal 180. But this says for a single patient, so in that particular case. Here. And, and we didn't. What? We didn't want to create a situation where a person's supply had to be exhausted before they could buy more, kind of like an early refill type thing, and just, but we didn't want to leave it unlimited because I think that creates a uh, uh, problem for law enforcement and the like, and, and this was... <clears throat> Um, I, I appreciate that, but I, I, I question whether it should be 180 days, which is two, whether it could be half of that or whatever, because I do understand it, even with my own medications, I know I like to get down to about half, but I never, my physicians never let me have more than my 90 day, two 90 day supplies before I do it. And, and where I'm coming from on this is the diversion piece. And that's really where we're very, very conscious of being um, diligent to make sure that there's not enough marijuana products laying around that they can easily, you know, get get lost or get, lose track of them and they become, uh, you know, s somehow used much like our opiate pills do out of the medicine cabinet, that we, we keep it so that the more access and availability you have to something, the more they, the use goes up and we know that as environmental strategy. So if someone in a house that has 180 days supply of it and you have teenagers in the whole house who think this is great stuff could easily divert it and may not even realize that it's gone. So that, that's just my thoughts on it. Okay. I do have a question on K. Just for my own mind, just to clarify that we are by rule prohibiting the establishment of a commerce exclusively in the business of being caregivers. Yes. Right? That, yes. That, that will not be a business per se or, or, a, or a job. That is the intent. Okay. Yes. Right. Just want to be clear on that. Anything else? Yeah, Tony. Totally. Can they reimburse for gas or? Y yes. Yes. It, it can't be exclusively for serving as a caregiver for medical marijuana. Is, is there an expectation at some point that we're going to define what under the influence means? N not at not at this time no so that would that would likely require statutory change I, I can tell you ted that as an organization that's sitting on the employer side of this question um i think with the ohio legislation being quite employer friendly um that i think you're seeing organizations 
but we'll probably be taking a relatively strict line with that. Whether they adopt different rules around drug testing or behavior in the workplace, this is we're being asked questions about this all the time. So that'll be in our in organizations like ours. It's going to be more of an HR de definition as opposed to a definition in statute or rule. But it's actively being talked about. Um, whether they're pulled over by police for a driving infraction, that I don't know. That, that probably can be a different kind of a thing. <clears throat> yes, Under L and K, I, I again I, with many of the same concerns I had that I just expressed about the um, the disposal of uh, marijuana um, that's not being used, or if their expiration of their registration runs out, or things. I in the real world, in the the ideal world, I guess is what I'm, I'm, I'm saying is that should happen. I don't know how really, how really realistic that will be. Uh, these products, because we know the expenses of doing this and making it a self-sustained um, uh, uh, program, um, the, the costs are going to be high. And I know that even now we find that with individuals who have opiates, those, those, those medications are expensive. And even when I'm done with it, I don't want to throw it out because, well, paid for them and I think that I might need it again so I want to keep it and or you know my husband's he's not feeling well so maybe he can use it so I don't I, I, again I'm worried about the diversion here I don't have an answer to this I just have a grave concern and I think this is one of those places where we will lose a little bit of the control and the hope that we have for this program uh, so if somebody has a brilliant idea that I'm not having at 3 30 in the afternoon on Friday <laughs> I would certainly welcome it <laughs> The only, I can draw a parallel, um, and I, I, I was looking for it in the dispensary rules. I don't think I saw it. Um, so the classic case that we deal with in the pharmacy profession is a hospice patient now passes away, and now we have a home full of narcotics. Um, same thing will be occurring here, because the potential to occur here. So two questions for me. One, is that in, in the case where a patient dies, does that now fall directly to the caregiver to handle that disposition? Is that the expectation? I'm not sure it's clear here that they own that now when their trustee, if you will, is now no longer alive. The, I can clean that up because the intent would be yes, if there is an associated caregiver to that patient and the patient is now deceased, it would be the caregiver's responsibility. Okay. To, wanna, to, yes, I can clean that up. Clean that up. The second thing is in the dispensary rules, much in the pharmacy space, patients will now try to take these back to pharmacies and say, I don't want to do with this here. You deal with it. I, I just want to kind of put it on our radar screen that dispensaries may pro will probably face the same kind of request mm -hmm. when a patient is no longer, and if they want, to, they want to do what they want to do, which is right, and we don't know where to go with it. And the dispensaries is the logical first choice. I got it Absolutely. from you, I'm giving it back to you. So. We should probably be mindful of that. That is that is something that we have started to discuss internally, and uh, we're, we're work, we are working on a solution, and it is a concern uh, of ours. Okay. All right. and, and the drug take back in general is a, a big concern of ours, and, and in fact, we have a statutory mandate to operate a uh, essentially a drug take back program, and we're working at it constantly. And, and just to run through one other thought, I mean, it's entirely possible based on the um, contours of the statute that somebody could have a, re a uh, expired re registration that they're just waiting to get uh, the next appointment with their doctor, right? And so I think it's, it's a little bit much to ask them seven days after that's expired when they're just waiting to, to get in to see their doctor or to get their registration renewed to say that they have to destroy their medicine or be in violation of the statute when they're just waiting to get in to see their doctor. I, I understand that. And in the rule, we did uh, we did give even more uh, leeway, actually, for, for a patient because the patient's, uh, it's not, the patient's registration does not expire at exactly one year. It's, it's at the end of the month of that one year. Um, but they, they are on notice that they have to get in with their physician to receive a new recommendation before that one year is up. 
Right. And, and just kind of going back to the concerns that were expressed to you directly at the, the meeting, at you and the medical board, about concerns of the expense of having to go back to the doctor, say, four times in a year to continue to, to have this recertified. That, that is not, not required four times in a year. One, one time a year. So the Board of Pharmacy just recently passed rules giving pharmacies latitude in the case where prescriptions have expired to dispense as a bridge therapy to get them through. I think we put a 30-day limit on that. Any thought that we're going to go here with this rule, or I just don't want it to be an assumed parallel since we just promulgated that rule? Uh, we'll have to look at it. I, a, a couple of things. I, I think with the, the rule that permits someone essentially from early refilling so that they have it on hand, um, you know, ideally, I, I think there's an adequate opportunity to to get it renewed, and then there's also the caregivers, and I, I we'll we'll see how it plays out. I think. Okay. Okay. Other thoughts here? 